Gujarat is a startup that makes a range of agro-based and biodegradable products with low carbon emission. They aim to reduce plastic and paper waste for a sustainable tomorrow. Let's know all about it from its co-founder Rishabh. In an era where environmental sustainability is becoming increasingly critical, the concepts of recycling and the circular economy offer compelling solutions to the pressing challenges of resource depletion, waste management and climate change. These practices are not only beneficial for the environment but also provide significant economic and social advantages. Today, we are going to meet a chain maker who has started his journey to promote a sustainable lifestyle by reducing plastic and paper waste to create a versatile alternative suitable for any occasion. Let's meet the co-founder of disposable tableware brand, Kudra. Welcome to the show, Rishabh. Thank you for having me, sir. And uh, Pleasure I, to be here. Yeah, same here. We are glad to have you today on our show here. So, Rishabh, why do you think recycling is important and how does it help to create a circular economy? So, when you look at uh, nature as such, the resources that we have on this planet are of costly limited and they are not unlimited and hence we must use these uh, resources judiciously and at the same time uh, there is also the fact that we have to keep the environmental cost in mind so when um, uh, whatever we take out from nature it must be res responsibly used and it must be adequately used hence the law of recycling comes in whatever we are taking from the earth we converted into a product that can go back into the planet itself. Okay, so we would like to know how and when did you first start thinking about this business? Like there was a trigger or something happened that, you know, you know, pushed you towards this area? So, so uh, I mean, it's an interesting story because I come from a background of uh, automobile. And uh, when I was de doing my CA in my second year itself, I dropped out. And then I got the opportunity in 2016 to look after our automobile business. So when I was doing that, I mean, um, it was quite a traditional business as such. And uh, when you're doing a traditional business, um, and of course, that's a family business that you're doing. Hence, there was always this question me that I want to carve my own identity and I want to do it in a separate field. Now, when I, we started identifying uh, what are the opportunities available in the market, we saw that waste was a big problem and wherever you see a problem, I think an opportunity is very likely to be there too. Hence, we took this challenge of uh, working in the waste sector. We didn't always have, um, I would say, uh, the journey was started from solid waste, it went into wet waste for some time, it went into electronic waste after some time. And then finally, we narrowed down upon agricultural waste. And how did this also happen was that during COVID, I happened to be visiting uh, a friend of mine and they have a sugar industry. Hence, uh, he's 25 years older to me, a mentor to me. And uh, when I was doing that, he was talking about how uh, they used to buy sugarcane bagas back in the day from a supplier. But that supplier has stopped supplying that commodity to them now because he's making disposable tableware out of it. So I think we picked the idea from there. We doubled down on it. We tried... Uh, finding what could be a more competitive product that we can build on all the drawbacks of what the existing product that has to offer. And that is how we really um, started with the company. This is 2020, uh, November we incorporated. Okay, so then you you know, you know thought okay, this is the area you should be working on. So tell us about the early days of Kudrat because starting a new business is always a challenge. There are like many, many areas which you need to deal with and it's not so easy, you know, navigating the uh, new business. So what, uh, tell us about the early days, how did this, this all unfold and you know, how did all this come about? So, so I think uh, the earlier days are probably uh, the hardest days, but I think uh, these are the days that you really smile back upon. I mean, I would still say we have hard days right now too, and we are still early. But when we had started, um, I mean, right from, so our raw material has to be agricultural waste. So identifying the kind of raw material that you can get at a suitable cost that has, let's say, a good amount of supply. You will not face uh, constraints in terms of uh, 
supply of that product so identifying that part was very important and then implementing it into your technology and how much time it will take to uh, you know sort of shortlist from rice husk rice straw water hyacinth banana stem or banana leaves and what of it um, first mapping out the supply chain side secondly also the fact that whether it will work in your technology or not so i think that took a lot of time for us and we finally narrowed down on rice husk and rice straw our first unit and uh, yes i think that was one of the biggest challenges that we had to overcome there were a lot of um, smaller things that also happened during this uh, trying to find uh, what exactly would be the supply chain whether you have to interact with the farmer directly or whether it is a mill based process that you'll have to go in for going out in the field and finding out how exactly we can procure this and procure this in bulk working out the transportation side so uh, i think that was probably uh, the beginning of the challenges and once we even got the raw material to our place the problem then came about quality so once you start going into manufacturing things like rejection the kind of quality of raw material that you are receiving how much of gravel is there in that material how much of moisture is there in that material that had a significant amount of uh, relation correlation with uh, what we were producing so i think this was uh, probably one of the first and the biggest challenges secondly our technology partner happened to be a government institute so when you are working with a government institute i mean um, the way that they work whereas the way that we work i mean it's on it's a different equation altogether so getting that and uh, getting a whole team of scientists to work together with you and uh, you know converting it successfully from uh, let's say a research a uh, base technology to something that can give you production on a commercial scale pilot scale to begin with i think that is a uh, grueling task in itself and keeping all the stakeholders involved and uh, listening to everyone but then taking decisions at times a lot of scientific analysis leads to paralysis in the project so uh, those kind of things were coming up and i think navigating through those times was uh, probably uh, one of the most challenging bits but i think we got to learn a lot from that and i think that experience really is very valuable to us today okay so the raw materials that you are using are not very traditional ones and it's basically a waste of some other products so can you take us through the entire process like what all the raw materials that are you using and uh, what all uh, are you making out of them and the process behind it how does it you know get turned into a product all these raw materials so um uh, essentially we work with uh, five kinds of agri waste uh, rice husk rice straw these are both by products of when you cultivate paddy uh, we also work with coconut leaves pollen coconut leaves that we convert it and uh, convert into straws and then there is also sugarcane bagasse so sugarcane bagasse is what is left after the sugarcane juice has been extracted out of uh, the cane and uh, these go through various processes of uh, so uh, for example rice husk and rice straw it goes through a process of grinding milling uh, heating and then finally mixing and which finally goes into compression molding so there is a series of steps that's involved before it gets converted into the product but yes if i would take the case of uh, rice husk and rice straw one of our uh, uh, premium range so the journey starts right from um the farmer who is supplying the paddy to the rice mill and at the rice mill level they are able to separate this husk out of the rice grain so this is the husk that we purchase from them which is otherwise used as a fuel by industries to burn in their boilers and we are able to convert this coming into our factory and the four or five processes that follow mixing grinding heating um and again uh, you know uh, mixing with various kinds of materials and then finally going into compression molding and to get a finished product so let's go back to the you know research part of your project like what made you choose these particular ingredients uh, i mean something like you know there were some properties which were suitable for uh, conversion into this tableware or what what made you choose these materials what was behind this choice so uh, essentially when we started with the project at the lab scale level there were various raw materials that we had to choose from now for example we had uh, rice husk rice straw water hyacinth banana stem and banana leaves pineapple leaves also but uh, our initial inhibition was that we wanted to work with water hyacinth but when you practically went into the field trying to understand how are you going to extract this material 
how are you going to collect it what is the cost that is going to come about in the collection how much is it going to cost to take to your factory and is the conversion uh, you know how optimum is the conversion and is it financially viable for a unit so with that being said i mean there were five or six raw materials that we evaluated and then we finally narrowed down on rice husk and rice straw rice straw of course is expensive in kerala but rice husk we were able to finally narrow down on and get all of these boxes ticked on uh, the supply chain side the production side whether you are able to get a you know optimum product with it and can you make financial sense out of it so i think these were the factors that we really considered okay so uh, tell us what all products are you making right now and which one of them are edible also i, I believe uh, some products of yours are also edible so can you just enlist the products that you're making right now out of these materials so we um, i mean starting right from the bottom uh, from sugarcane bagas we make all fine kinds of tableware when i say tableware we mean to say plates bowls takeaway containers clamshells and uh, various kind of compartment plates then sugarcane bagas again is divided into two parts there's a white color and there's a natural color so these are basically part of cost effective range of arts which is the entry range for anybody who wants to go into sustainability the next product that we have in our premium range so there we have rice husk and rice straw which we make plates and cups out of currently and uh, this range is since it is made essentially from agri waste without um, any form of adhesives laminate and lining it is also something that the animals can consume both on land and in water so it can be used as fish feed it can be used uh, i mean as cattle feed post its your use by us and beyond that we've also developed an edible range which is again rice flour and wheat flour that is something that can be eaten by human beings also we only do cutlery in it specifically spoons and that is something that you can also have post your meal so for any new product category customers adaptability is always an issue so making people adapt to this new kind of tableware i mean how did you address that challenge i i think we are still addressing it while we speak and uh, i think over there so sort of the biggest uh, factor is that uh, it's a time taking process for anybody to move from uh, one trend to another so for example if we take electric cars so i think 2018 probably 2% of global sales in electric was electric cars whereas if you look at 2023 i think it stands at 18% so now similarly for the sustainable uh, disposable tableware industry our figure also stands close to around 2% uh, as on date but it is going to grow now how are you going to get uh, people to adapt to this number one legislation plays a very important role so if for example there are certain items in india that have been banned and uh, once there are more alternatives available to it and the government has played a crucial role over there people have um, i mean whether it's businesses whether it's individual people the only products available in the market now would be a paper based product or it will be a an agri waste based product which we make so legislation i think would be um, the most important pillar there and of course after legislation also comes enforceability of that legislation so are the rules being followed properly is there no supply of plastic based products for single use and disposable tableware us that there is also the fact that the first time that you are able to get a customer to adopt adapt your product i think once that happens there is no going back for the customer once they have experienced this product of yours it is very difficult for them to uh, you know in terms of habitual change that they would want to go back to a plastic based product and uh, i mean experience oriented of course i mean the entry level range and then we have our premium range with that being said the customer profile is such that once somebody also experiences the premium range then it is so distinctive in itself that they would want to continue with that and uh, for example a use case would be an event where there is so much of many uh, i mean the wedding industry in india there's so much of money that's spent on decoration there's so much of money that's spent on catering and uh, if you know this application comes into the budget of these weddings where whatever you have to use has to be sustainable it is a very small part of your budget if you look at it that way so i think more and more people are adopting it it's just about the first time adoption 
and once that happens you know it, it sort of becomes a trend and of course the government support is probably something that can help all of us tremendously yeah of course the policy will play a crucial role when it comes to you know environment friendly materials or you know in anything which is concerned with environment and i'm sure uh, you will get a lot of help from the policies which are coming up from the government side and all the best for that so now my next question is about your startup how did this got funded or did you get any kind of a financial support from say a, there was an angel investor or any anything any other platform so how did this startup come about so uh, in terms of uh, funding so essentially uh, we are uh, bootstrap and being bootstrap means you are funded by a banker by nature which could be in the form of family or friends and we remained like that but other than that from the government side and the grant side so in terms of we are part of the kerala startup mission and uh, from there itself we have received close to around 10 lakh rupees in grants other than that we have received the startup india seed fund which is a soft loan given by the government to us that is close to around 20 lakhs then the central government from the agricultural ministry has also given us close to 25 lakh rupees so we are close to around 60 lakh rupees in grants and uh, funds given to us by the government and this is going to continue like uh, i mean this year also we see another uh, big chunk coming into uh, this whole process we also participate actively in various kinds of competitions where you can get grants for whatever what kind of startup you are building and uh, we got a 2 lakh rupee grant from Ernst and Young for this to pilot with them in their organization so similar basis i think there are a lot of opportunities available now for anybody to secure funding in this form also where you are not getting an investor on board but you are getting a grant by the government or by some private organization so that's very uh, good news coming from your side that funding part has not been a major problem you have been getting some kind of a support from you know various corners so that's very heartening to hear So now tell us about your market presence. Where all can we see your products? Where all you know we can go and buy your products from? So, um, so essentially, uh, when you talk about market presence, so we divide ourselves into various channels. So on the direct to customer front, we are available, of course, in India. We have also started doing work in the US, Canada, Mexico, and United Kingdom. We do all of this through Amazon India and Amazon Global. so amazon global is another platform where you can stock your products in the warehouses over there and then sell your products in those respective countries on the business to business front uh, in india we have close to around 45 clients now and uh, these are monthly or um, some of them are bigger clients who have a pan india presence close to around um 150 to 200 units across the country some of them are smaller ones uh, one or two units somewhere maybe a cafe somewhere but this comes from all across the country we have clients in goa we have clients in himachal pradesh we have clients now we are talking to them in the andamans also so the b2b market for us is quite spread out in india and we are trying to grow this tremendously we are trying to work with bigger aggregators um trying to get onboarded with them also so that we can become part of their supply chain the conversations are on and uh, beyond this for the foreign markets also we are trying to find partners who can uh, buy our product in bulk and who are already part of the distribution system there and uh, they can help us you know propagate our product in on a bigger level in those respective countries once we see that scope has grown so much once we see that we are doing well in those places tomorrow we would want to take our warehousing there and then maybe distribute in those markets also by ourselves so that's wonderful so going forward what are your projections like what are the what are the targets that you set for yourself so um so we um so 23 24 was our first year in sales we did close to around 72 lakhs in revenue for 23 24 this year we are looking anything between 300 to 500 lakhs and we have an aim that by 2028 uh, so 27 28 will be our fifth year in operations we have an ambitious goal of hitting a target where you know we are able to establish ourselves as a 100 crore rupee uh, turnover based company and uh, i think that is totally achievable the market is big enough it is just about getting ourselves well penetrated especially in the international market the kind of conversations we are having the kind of demand that we see coming in uh, 
um, of course, there are a lot of challenges that are there in this, and we know that China is the workshop of the world, and their products are also very good in terms of quality. I would say, but I I feel that if we are able to grab even a small share from these places, there is a big business that you can build out of this. Of course, and I'm sure you'll be able to. And uh, the kind of zeal and commitment you guys have, I'm sure you'll be able to achieve your target, which are very healthy ones. And I would uh, you know like to. Uh, congratulate you on achieving the numbers that you have till now and the, your future projections are definitely achievable and i'm sure you'll get there so uh, rishab to end this uh, conversation please tell us like what impact do you think your organization your startup your products are going to have on the society at large so I, i'll give you an example for this so um i mean i'm in trivandrum and uh, we have a beach here so uh, when i had recently moved to the city i was trying to find things to do around here so i joined the local surfing club and uh, kovlam surf club as it happens to be we go surfing almost every sunday whenever the weather permits of course it's raining right now but when you go out into the sea do you realize the problem actually so when we are surfing we are hit by plastic bottles you are hit by cement bags you are hit by all kinds of plastic litter and <clears throat> we are still bigger in size as human beings you can pick up that bottle and you can throw it away you can pick up that paper cup and you can put it away you can remove that cement bag but imagine the marine life that is there down below probably i mean the turtle that gets the straw in its nostril or the fish that gets trapped inside an old fishing net or the fish that are feeding on the plastic down below it's fatal for all of them and they have nothing that they can really do about it so this is just one case other than this uh, i mean i also enjoy scuba diving and i am a certified uh, scuba diver so when you go down onto the ocean floor in today's time i mean not that i know much about marine life and fish but it's easier for you to identify the plastic down below than you can identify the fish i mean actually you would know every wrapper that is there i mean what does it represent and the brand from far away you won't know what fish is that but you know that is the same orange color wrapper that uh, is sold in your supermarket uh, for that specific company so the waste uh, waste is actually a big problem it's just that it has to come into our eyes and now when we are able to build a business where you are able to replace this with a degradable product you are able to help these animals prevent these animals from dying you are able to uh, remove this um, disposable product in the form of single use plastic from the landfills and at the same time earn money for doing the same so i feel that is the bigger impact that we are looking at but when we also talk about the company as such of course single use plastic replacement but we are also helping give that agricultural waste which is burnt a second life which if burnt accelerates global warming it causes air pollution it causes various kinds of respiratory diseases so we are able to also convert that so with this solution we are able to solve a number of environmental problems and that of course gives us a lot of satisfaction that's wonderful rishab uh, i mean i wish we'll have more and more environmental warriors like you to make our earth better our life better so thank you so much for joining us today and we are very glad to hear the kind of work that you're doing and we wish you all the best in your endeavor and we hope that you'll make a big difference as you just said uh, to our society to our world at large so thank you so much and keep doing the good work Thank you sir thank you for having me and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our story look forward to talking soon thank you so much for joining rishab the concepts of recycling and circular economy can form a comprehensive strategy for addressing some of the most pressing environmental economic and social challenges of our time by conserving resources reducing pollution creating jobs and fostering innovation these practices offer a path towards a more sustainable and resilient future Embracing recycling and the principles of the circular economy is not just an option but a necessity for ensuring the well-being of our planet and future generations. I hope the efforts of innovators like Rishab will help people embrace this culture. Goodbye.